We have been waiting quite some time to get our hands on Sakura Wars, and we've got it for you now, and it's all in this evening. Anime. You can't really get away from it. It's in the sky when you walk down the street. You go to a baseball game, and it followed you there, too. You just want a cup of coffee, and it will not leave you alone. It's everywhere. Telephones used to be for talking to people, now you watch Sailor Moon on the top of a mountain. We no longer live in yellow subtitle world where the hobby was relegated to fan conventions and comic book stores, but for some people that's just not enough. You could spend an entire hour picking out something good, and even if you like it at the end of the day, a lot of people say to themselves, I bet there was something better. This paradox of choice has led a couple of people down the road less traveled, sidestepping conventional anime. And as you go down that road, it leads to increasingly more esoteric forms of entertainment. Rare printings of shows made exclusively for airlines, live TV recordings that are so blurry that they border on unwatchable, and searches for entire movies that may have only aired a single time. The call of lost media speaks to us all, and when searching for the abstract and the unknown, a singular question drives people forward. That question being, where's the anime? If somebody was going to ask you where anime was, I think it would be kind of confusing. The majority of people would say that it's online, or possibly on home video, but before a series even makes its way onto TV, well, it has to come from somewhere now, doesn't it? And that somewhere is film. Or at least it used to be. The world of film contained the majority of anime for over a hundred years, and many people consider it to be the final frontier of lost media as well. Everything from TV shows to full movies used to be stored on film, and oftentimes they contain things that are so undocumented that we don't even know that they exist. Commercials that only aired a handful of times as an example, trailers that differ wildly from the final product, and sometimes entire series that we only know about through TV guide listings. Well, if there's so much lost media out there, so much anime waiting to be discovered, why don't we hear about people restoring them from film? Well, the answer is fairly obvious. The barrier of entry is so high that most people simply don't have the time nor the resources to even touch this. Anyone can rip a VHS tape, but for every 10 million people with a VCR, you might find that one person that can scan a film, and even less that can restore it. Here's what the Mario Brothers anime used to look like on VHS. It's not particularly bad or anything, but you could tell it should be a little bit sharper than that. And since it came out in 1986, this was the very best that we could possibly get. It only came out on home video, so what can you do? Well, it remained that way until just recently, when somebody scanned the original film as it aired in movie theaters from the original sources, and now, here's what it looks like in 4K. Film reels contain some of the highest resolution videos ever made, and you'll often find some pretty crazy things on them too. Things like series that are so unknown that they border on myth and legend. Okay, maybe that's a little bit too far, but this is the kind of thing that gets me up in the morning, and one such anime was found earlier this year, which made the rounds pretty quickly within the lost media community. It's not often that you find an anime on a film reel, and it's doubly unlikely to find an anime from a company that no longer exists. Adding on to that, it was from a company that destroyed almost every single anime that they ever made. Or at least most of them anyway, I'll get to that later in the video. The point being is sometimes you don't even know what you have in your hands. So here's my first-hand account of what we believe to be the very last copy of a series stuck on film. A fad or a foreshadowing? Are we all susceptible to the lure of information as our access to it becomes unlimited? The anime starts with an old man who traveled a long way up a mountain, collapsing in a cave. In it lies Shadar, the boy savior of the world, waiting to be awoken from his cryogenic sleep. The old man tells Shadar of his destiny, and then he slowly fades away. The story then begins, and it becomes an episodic adventure anime. Before Shonen Jump, you had things like Shonen Sunday with characters like Marine Boy, Charge Man Ken, and Shadar the Shadow Boy, all fighting monsters with blasters and bare fists. Or in Shadar's case, a magic sword of light. 
Each episode would follow him as he explores a ruined world, and at the end of each one you would have to tune in next time for the next exciting episode of Shadar. Populating the anime is a bunch of fairly generic characters, it was the 60s, don't, don't be too hard on it. You've got Professor Mambo who provides Shadar with all of his scientific support. He flies around in a UFO, using what I can only assume to be some sort of 1960s futuristic scotch tape to hold it all together. That or it's just really, really high resolution and nobody ever thought anyone would see this. It's also got a talking dog sidekick in it, because every single show back then had to have one. And then you have the ultimate evil, the ancient demon ghoster. A vampire monster with a cape that can shapeshift at will. I love this guy. Most of the stories center around him impersonating village chiefs and royalty, you know, just important people trying to turn the world against the main character. And a lot like Golden Bat, his powers are undefined and made up on the fly, so you know, they keep things interesting. He's got a talking cat as a sidekick, he's just kind of there, doesn't really do anything. If you're wondering why the story's so simple, the delineation between cartoon and anime, it was not as distinct as it is today. Most of the characteristics that people would associate with anime weren't really established, so back then most people just considered it another cartoon. It reminds me of stuff like Thundar, The Barbarian, I used to watch that a lot as a kid. It's got abandoned buildings in it, ancient magic, giant monsters running amok. Lots of spooky stuff for the kids to enjoy. Yeah, you know, for a while, anyway. At some point they drop that talking dog. Ghoster's cat? just turns into a regular cat for some reason, I don't know why, and the story turns dramatically, dramatically towards the dark. It all coincides with the introduction of Shadar's sidekick, Rocco. He's got no powers. Rocco is just some kid, but his family was turned into monsters by Ghoster. Did I mention that he can do that? He, he's magic. Do I need to explain that the main villain can just like turn people into monsters? A child would not need that explained to them, okay? Unfortunately, I don't have the first half of the episode where any of that goes down, but it doesn't end uh, all that well for Rocco. It's not often you see an anime where a kid's family burns themselves alive, but that happens here, and it's kind of brutal, especially for something this old. People understandably thought that this anime was terrifying at the time, and it granted it a reputation as a horror anime, though really, it's more of like an adventure cartoon, what exactly scared them is unknown. But here's a few examples I can give from the episodes that still exist. One starts with the demon ghoster ending a man who carved a human mask for somebody to wear. Later on, Shadar is dispatched by a king to try and look for somebody who ends up being a faceless imposter. Towards the end of that episode, his lack of face is revealed, and then he gets sent plummeting to his end. That's one thing that you really notice about this show, someone gets bumped off every single story. In the first one, the old man passes on, in another one, someone walks into a fire, another one has all of these human-shaped clay monsters crumble to dust, screaming right before the viewer's eyes, and I can kind of see why this had such an impact on young viewers. These are all from the early parts of the series too, it's anyone's guess how much darker it gets. Much of the history of this anime is shrouded in mystery. It went by many, many names, making it very, very difficult to look up. In Brazil, the show was known as Sombrita. In Venezuela, it went by Shadow Boy. And in Japan, it was known as Adventure Boy Shadar. It was broadcast on the Italian channel Junior TV for a while, where the majority of these episodes come from. But as far as I can tell, the rest of them are lost. Around half of the series just doesn't exist anymore, and the episodes that we do have are such bad quality, you know, we may as well not even have them. There isn't even any real consensus as to how many episodes of this there are. A few websites say there's over a hundred, some say there's only around 26. Nobody really knows, it's that old. It's a series that survives by VHS rips and VHS alone. All in different languages, by the way. All from different countries. All in different quality. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it historically relevant? Who knows, you can't really watch it. If you do want to go down that road and attempt to see something nobody's really seen since the 1960s, I really, really, really recommend you not do that and uh, you're not gonna have fun. It's not gonna be a good time. Here's some things about the quality of this anime that I ran into when I tried to watch this. Black and white episodes. 
episodes at low resolution. Some episodes that move because they were recorded with a camcorder that bounces up and down. Stories with gigantic watermarks. Episodes where the audio doesn't match what people are saying. Episodes in languages that you don't understand. Episodes in the wrong aspect ratio. Episodes that only exist as fragments, so you start the series in the beginning of the episode, and then it just cuts off and you don't know how they end. One watermark on top of another watermark, on top of another watermark. With that said, it aired all over the world, so it's kind of weird that it disappeared like this. But in the face of its extreme obscurity, it gained a reputation as a show that scared a lot of kids. Shadar will likely never be re-released due to a bunch of legal shenanigans, to put it lightly. I'll get into that in a bit, but the short end of it is nobody owns this anime anymore, which has afforded it quite a lot of protection from copyright hounds. You see, one of the advantages to an anime company going out of business is it allows the show to propagate throughout the internet completely undisturbed. I've got a feeling even if every single anime got removed from the internet one day, yeah, you know, Shadar will still probably be bouncing around in 240p in black and white. How half of this show became lost in the first place is kind of interesting in itself, and it gives us a lot of valuable leads into many other lost anime. As I mentioned before, the company that made Boken Hero Shadar no longer exists, and even when they were around, they weren't really on the up and up as they say. During their six year run as a company, they changed their name three times. According to a couple of very helpful Doraemon wikis, Nippon TV Video was created as Japan Broadcast Video Studio in 1965. They then lasted with that name until 1968, when Shadar finished airing. Then they went by the name Tokyo TV Video, and then they changed their name to Nippon TV Video in 1971, immediately after they basically went completely out of business. This name shuffle is a byproduct of a bunch of shady management that eventually caused the company to dissolve overnight, taking many anime with it. Nippon TV Video is known for being a kind of Bermuda Triangle of lost anime, and nearly everything that they've touched has become lost, or was preserved very, very poorly. Say what you will about Shadar. At least you can watch some of it. Tatsukai Osper? That's gone. Most people don't care about 60s anime. It's kind of important to discuss here for a second though because it frames what happens to many other anime that they made and all we have is the intro, the music, and nothing else so I can't even expand on it if I wanted to so I may as well talk about it now. 53 episodes were produced and not a single one of them survives. You can't watch one episode of Tatakai Osper. And uh, it continues, 70s fashion anime Monshiri Coco is also gone. Of the 13 episodes they made, none survive. All we have is some cell art from auction sites and a theme song to go with it. I highly, highly doubt anyone in the 1970s was going, I bet people decades from now are gonna look through newspapers to find pictures of some anime we made. But, well, that's what people did. Some of the only images of this exist as newspaper clippings, which is a lot more common than you would think. What's really frustrating about the whole situation is it ran on TV into the early 90s where, well, that was well within the era where TV recordings became a thing, which means somebody should have it. It would be incredibly unlucky if they didn't. Occasionally you'll see some people say that they have the whole series recorded from when it aired, but nobody's sharing those tapes for some reasons that I'll get into later in the video. If you're wondering why we even have footage of any of these shows, it's because the intros were on a compilation of popular 60s and 70s anime on VHS. Coincidentally, that's the same reason that we have the opening to Shadar. If it wasn't on some bargain bin tape, we wouldn't even know how it started. Now in theory, there's a Laserdisc version of this collection too, and it's from something called the Anime Memorial TV Renaissance Series. Sounds like a funeral that you would have for lost media from Japan, but it's got some of the only proof that many of these shows ever made it onto TV. If you get your hands on this thing, be prepared to have dozens of openings to anime that haven't aired in decades. How this all became lost in the first place is even stranger. For fans of Fujiko Fujio, this is all gonna be fairly common knowledge. 
the very first Doraemon anime has been famously lost since it first aired, and it's probably the most famous piece of lost anime on the entire lost anime spectrum. As the story goes, in the middle of production, the president of the company paid off his debt, and then he just disappeared one day, in the middle of Doraemon airing as it was on TV. With nobody to run the company, they basically shut down overnight and that's what happened to most of their anime. The creators of Doraemon were understandably weirded out by the whole situation, and they barred it from ever being re-released, and even blocked it from being rerun on TV. Rumors say the entire show was thrown away to save money, though a few secondhand prints are said to still exist in private hands. Those are the same kind of prints that Shadar was found on too, so we might see the original Doraemon one day as well. That's assuming it exists at all. 70s preservation was not what it is today, meaning that if any of these anime still survive, they're probably on the brink of destruction. And now would probably be a good time to bring up how somebody found a 16mm film reel for an anime we thought to be lost in the first place. Well, before the 1990s when people switched over to mastering anime on D2 videotape, they would edit on film using the original negatives, and then after that they would make positive copies to send out to TV stations. These channels would then run the film on a telecine for broadcast, and that's what you would see on TV. After all of these years, some collectors, of which we can only really assume worked in TV back in the day, saved these prints, preventing them from being destroyed. However, Japan is an unforgiving nation when it comes to film preservation, and not a lot of these collectors were very well equipped to properly store any of this. It resulted in many of them literally fading away. The older film gets, the more that it fades, and Shadar was one such series. If it wasn't scanned when it was, it would have been lost in the span of a couple of years. To put it simply, Japan is very humid, and having an anime just sit in a box somewhere is not a good idea. Take a look at how bad Shadar was before it was fixed. I don't even know how you get color from something that looks like this, but there's some amazing, amazing people out there that fix these things. Restorationists try their best to correct this, but sometimes an anime is too far gone and, well, there's really nothing you can do. Not only do anime fade, they also get attacked by the environment. Things like mold eat holes in the film, and that's what all these little green specks are. They're pieces of the film that are no longer there because they got eaten through by mold and now, well, the anime is the way it is and there's nothing you can do about it. As an example of how bad it can be, here's what a badly damaged episode of Sally the Witch looks like. Now this isn't lost media, at all, just putting that out there, but it's never had an HD version, and if it's not done now, it's never going to be. Unfortunately, by the time this reached the right people, it was basically done, I mean, you can see for yourself. Sally the Witch was anime's first magical girl, so it's really, really sad to see something like this happen. If mold and fading weren't bad enough, there's also the smell. The older film gets, the more prone it is to falling apart due to something called vinegar syndrome. It's a chemical reaction that happens when the material that film is made of reacts with the air, and it's kind of like how metal will rust. As it progresses, it breaks down continuously, and it causes the film to deteriorate, and once that begins, there's really no going back. The anime will warp more and more until it literally crumbles into dust. You can slow it down with a couple of techniques, but once it begins, that anime is on its way to being lost forever. And as you can tell from the name, it, uh, it doesn't smell very good either. This anime smelled so bad, it got sealed in an airtight box with the words DO NOT OPEN written all over it. So, you know, that can't even be scanned again because your nose will burn off. There's also scratches to worry about. Yeah, it gets worse. When the 60s series Kaminari Boy was released on DVD, the first episode looked like this. Scratches, fading, vinegar syndrome. The amount of things that you have stacked against you is enough to discourage even the most hardcore anime fans. Not only do you have to contend with all that, there's also people that don't want you to get these things in the first place. When only a single copy of an anime exists, while well, telling people about it could be potentially disastrous. This is something that I like to call the lost media problem. So let's say you're looking for a lost anime, and I'm talking really, really lost. It's not on VHS, it never aired on TV, and you're pretty sure you're the only person on planet Earth who's trying to find it. 
What do you do? If you make an announcement about it, a couple of things are going to happen. If you're lucky, somebody will say, oh hey, I have that, I'll send it on over. The anime gets saved, people decades later can see it. Basically, everyone wins. That's the best case scenario. It's also pretty much what happened with Shadar. Somebody had it and a few months later, now that's available in HD. But on the other hand, when people know that you want something, that means they want it too. Most people would say raising awareness is the right thing to do, but as an example of how that can go horribly wrong, you need look no further than the retro gaming community. Now this isn't a story you're going to have heard of unless you're really into old video games like I am, but in 2019 there was an auction for an undumped Nintendo game from Japan. It had never been released, it was cancelled, that means nobody had ever played it, and eventually it sold that auction for a wallet busting $13,710. As you can see from this footage, it was basically done. Indy the Magical Kid was advertised heavily in 1992, and even had a bunch of artwork made for its release. Had it come out, it probably would have pushed the Famicom as hard as it could have gone, meaning people really wanted to play it, and with that said, well, people were pretty excited to see how this auction went. So it ended, somebody won, and they dumped the game online, right? No. The winner declared it would never be shared, and instead would be hoarded forever as a national treasure, never to leave Japan. As far as I know, it remains undumped to this very day. Nobody can play it. Now on one hand, I can see where people are coming from. If you consider anime and video games to be art, then it's no wonder people are dead set on things not leaving their country of origin. Many stolen or misplaced statues that once dotted museum halls were one day returned for very similar reasons, but video games are not statues. Is that... is that a hot take? That felt weird saying that. L let me go ahead and be more specific. A film reel and a video game, if left standing in a single place, they'll simply disappear. What was once a game is now nothing and now it is lost forever. It's just an empty shell that once contained what it used to be. This happens quite a lot and it's a silent battle that's going on in the background of many of your favorite hobbies, anime included. Again, if you knew of some lost anime that only existed on a film reel and there was probably only one copy of it and you were waiting for it to show up, what would you do? Would you tell somebody about it or would you hope that it pops up one day? It might go for sale, it might not. If it does, you can get it to the right people. And if it doesn't, the lack of exposure could doom it forever. It's a hotly debated topic among anime fans and media preservationists alike, but with some luck, you mentioning something is lost could make it available immediately. I had that happen myself when I mentioned an anime wasn't online anywhere, and the second I made a video about it, five copies went out for sale, and afterwards it was subtitled on YouTube in a matter of weeks. In a perfect world, people would save these things so they don't end up in landfills, but in a perfect world, preservationists would not need to exist. Enter the Film Scanners. Earlier this year, a group going by the name Kaneko Video decided it was now or never to save anime as we know it. The project would be fan-funded, and they would accept film reels all over the world from anyone willing to send them in. The result was dozens of anime that people had never even heard of being saved one after another, and even a couple of commercials too. And now we take a break for a product that no longer exists. Why yes, it's Glico Pick Picks. The world of restoration is an opportunistic hobby, so you buy what you can and you hope for the best. Such was the case with an unlabeled film containing some very odd footage. At first you don't know what to think of it, but looking at the box you can tell it's for a Japanese snack called Pick Picks. Now we don't have the original commercial that this would have gone to, but here's a similar one to give you an idea of what that would have been like. The live action part is only there for a few seconds, but they recorded a dozen takes and then they drew a little mascot character and there you go. Video this sharp doesn't happen by chance. It's on 35 millimeter film, and the bigger the film, the better the image. Starting with the smallest one that you'll find anime on, we have 8 millimeter film. That's the type that you would record home movies on, and a few fan shorts like the famous Daikon 3 were also sold at conventions that way. 
Coincidentally, someone did find one of those films, but by pure coincidence, again, I've been saying that a lot today, Gynax was doing their own restoration at the same time, so when they found out about it, they very kindly asked that it not be destroyed, so here's a little look at the unfixed footage. An incredible amount of care was being put into color correcting the original, and they were even going to track down the individual ink IDs used for every frame of the anime. Had this come out, the difference would have been night and day. To clarify what happened, this wasn't due to any sort of intimidation tactic by Gynax. They just didn't want other people doing it since they were already doing it themselves. Presumably, they have even higher grade film than what you're seeing here, so it's going to be really exciting to see what they have planned for it. Here's hoping they have something closer to 16mm film. 16mm was what most TV anime were stored on for a majority of the 80s and most of the 90s too, and if you wanted to watch an HD version of Dragon Ball, well, there's no other way to see it. There's a lot of confusion going on as to what the original creators of that series are doing with it, but basically they have no interest in putting it out there in HD. To drive that point home, this film reel that you're seeing here, this was fished out of a dumpster. Could you imagine being the kind of person who would throw away the only HD version of Dragon Ball? How embarrassing would that be? Then you have 35mm film. If you're wondering why the intros to a couple of anime look amazing while the shows just kind of look average, it's because a few of them used very high quality film stock just for the openings. The intro to Zeta Gundam always looked really oddly HD to me and now that explains it. So with that set up, 35mm film for something that people only saw on TV, it's kind of overkill. Those pic pics sure do look pretty good though, don't they? You can't buy them anymore. I checked. Back to the anime, here's a trailer for the series Legend of Light, the story of Hikari. This series is notable for being one of the few anime adapted from Margaret Magazine. It was ended at a shorter than normal 19 episode run, but singles, pops, and the super underrated A-Girl all come from the same place. Even educational anime are getting saved. Here's a short film made for classrooms called My Little Flying Fish is Sick. It was meant to teach children about the dangers of radiation poisoning. There was only a single copy of it online before it randomly went for sale, so it doesn't really get much more lost media than that. I'm told it's being shown in classrooms today thanks to this very restoration, so this is a great example of something with real-world applications being put into effect. Now this next one, it's not gonna seem interesting, but making a pineapple play the ukulele was a lot more impressive in 1987. According to a prior employee at Toyo Link, this short took four and a half hours to render per frame. If you ever hear somebody complaining about their computer, go ahead and show them this dancing pineapple. I'm pretty sure that'll shut them up. And finally, we have a commercial for the very, very cute 80s anime Maple Town Story. It's so clear that you can see the bottom of the frame that was cut out when it aired on TV. Not only did they find a commercial, but we lucked out and found a fire safety special as well. Now you can learn to be cool about fire safety with anime and HD. Using all of these techniques, you can save almost anything. There's a lot of stitching together to get the best possible release, but what if you're one of those people who's always complaining? You know the ones. The ones with the $5,000 TVs, who get visibly upset when they see 4x3 aspect ratio bars. The ones that won't touch an anime if it's even slightly, slightly blurry. Those people. How do you make them happy? You can make a perfect copy of a tape, but at the end of the day, VHS is still VHS. You cannot squeeze HD water out of a rock. Or can you? Now we enter the realm of theoretical upscaling. I would like to introduce this by saying that this is all very, very new, and what I'm about to talk about may not filter down to the general public for quite a while. With new emerging technology, companies have been feeding AI dozens and dozens of 80s anime and creating detail that was never there before. Again, it is just an example, a true HD version of Project Echo. it was done later, but take a look at how far you can push a laser disc just with computers alone. For anything not available in HD, you're looking at the future here. 
Now officially I have to condemn all of these practices, so you should never use what I said in this video to watch lost anime in HD. Absolutely not cool, don't do it, you will get in trouble because they will come down to your house and break down your door and you will never see the light of anime again. So whatever you do, don't go to Kaneko Video's channel and watch the Super Mario Bros. movie in 4K with full English subtitles right now after seeing this video, that would be wrong. Don't do it. And now that that's all been painstakingly explained, I hope this gives you a general idea of what's going on in the background of many of your favorite hobbies. Some things are stuck on VHS, others are out there slowly fading away, and there's a couple of anime that I cannot even mention without causing an avalanche of hoarders to destroy my favorite hobby, were it not for a few dedicated people scanning, saving, color correcting, subtitling all of these relics one by one, many historical oddities like the Mario Brothers movie would never be seen in HD again, so I sincerely thank them for all of their efforts. All of the anime that you saw today were funded through donations, so if you'd like to support them I'll leave a link where you can donate below. With all this stuff being found, I'm pretty sure we could find just about anything. Monshuri Coco, the lost episodes of Doraemon, Absolutely anything could be found at any moment. Sepsaki Sanabashi. That, 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 that doesn't exist. We have been in search of this series for two years. We have been trying and trying and trying to convince the distributor to let us have a crack at it, but until now they were unwilling. Well, finally they have come through and allowed us to show this to you, and that means this is its first time ever on television in the United States of America. We are proud to be continuing that tradition here at KTEH of never seen before on American television anime series, and this one we think is very important because we believe it's one of the best of all the anime series we've found to date. We're really enjoying it. Hope you are as well, and we've got lots of great reasons for you to become a member of this public television station this evening in order that we can continue doing this extraordinary thing of bringing, as a single station, bringing world premiere, or U.S. premiere, I should say, uh, anime series to our audience 